way through the book of uh, 1 Samuel together. Go ahead and grab your Bibles if you have them and join me at uh, 1 Samuel chapter 21. If you don't have your Bible with you this morning, you have no worries. We're really only going to look at one specific verse, but I know some of you like to follow along in the storyline in your own Bible. Some of you like to take notes in the margins, and so uh, if you'd like to do that, you can do that this morning. Well, we've, we've taken a couple of weeks away from our storyline, and so let me give us just a little bit of a review of the ground that we've covered so far. At the beginning of 1 Samuel, we see that God is both sovereign and king of Israel. That was always God's intention. God wanted Israel to stick out like a sore thumb. He wanted them to be like nobody else, so that when the nations around them saw all the amazing things going on in Israel, they would ask the question, how is that possible? You don't even have a king. To which the Israelites were able to say, oh, but we do have a king. He's the king of king and lord of lords. He is the one true God. And he's our king. He's our sovereign. He's the reason that all these amazing things are taking place. That was always God's plan. And at the beginning of 1 Samuel, we see that God raises up Samuel to be the priest and prophet, uh, sort of communicating with the people as God reigns as king. But as time goes along, the Israelites decide, we don't want to stick out like a sore thumb. We don't want to be different than everybody else. We want to be just like the people around us. Specifically, we want a human king who can lead us into battle. Well, in Saul, God gives the people exactly what they're looking for. Saul is a dynamic military leader, a, a military giant, but he is a spiritual infant. And instead of exercising his authority under God's sovereignty, Saul just does whatever seems best to him, just like all the other kings around him. Well, because of this repeated refusal to submit to God's sovereignty, God revokes Saul's kingship and selects David to be the next king of Israel. Well, that, of course, sets up immediate conflict between Saul, the guy who currently has the job, and David, the guy who's going to get the job. Now, David isn't perfect. In fact, as we will see in upcoming episodes, David is going to end up doing things we would never imagine in fact, he's going to end up doing things he would never imagine that he would do. But there's a big difference between David and Saul. David is a man after God's own heart. Which means that even though sin is just as much a problem for David as for anybody else, at the, at the end of the day, David pursues God's priorities first. Well, as we left off a couple weeks ago, a clear pattern has developed. David, time and time and time again, demonstrates his faithfulness to both God and Saul. Meanwhile, Saul is becoming increasingly jealous of David. In his desperate attempt to cling to power, Saul makes repeated attempts on David's life leaving David with no other option but to spend a season of his life on the run, hiding in hills, hiding in caves, even hiding in foreign countries just to get away from Saul. Well, we're picking the story up this morning at uh, 1 Samuel chapter 21. We're going to cover chapters 21, 22, and 23 today. We're going to do this at about 50,000 feet. Now, let me just explain the storyline to you. First, let me, um, let me give you a couple of um, geographic locations, just to sort of help you see where we are. Right here's the Dead Sea, and up there in the far corner, that little blue up there, that, that's the Mediterranean Sea. I want to point those out to you because last I checked, those bodies of water are still there. Okay? So that, this is the region that we're in. We also have three countries listed here. Over here, along the Mediterranean Sea, along the coastal plain of the Mediterranean Sea, is the country of Philistia. Over here, in what is modern-day Jordan, is the country of Moab. And right here between them 
in this mountainous region is the land of Judah. This is Saul's country. This is where the Israelites live. Now, David's first stop in his journey is that he heads to Nob. This is 1 Samuel 21, verses 1 to 9. And in Nob, a priest by the name of Ahimelech gives David food and something very important for a guy who's on the run. He gives him a weapon. Just so happens to be the very sword that David took off of Goliath when he killed him a few chapters ago. How's that for irony? So now David's got bread and he's got Goliath's sword. And that very same day, he heads on over to Gath. 1 Samuel 21, 10 to 24. This, now Gath is an important city in the land of Philistia. By the way, anybody know who was born there, who was raised there? Goliath. Yeah, it's Goliath's hometown. That's where David goes to hide. Now, he's going there to hide because if he gets to Philistia, he's safe from Saul. Just like if we're running away, we might head to Canada. Once you, once you get over that border, then Saul can't get to David. So he hides in this major city of Philistia. Just one problem. The people in Gath have an idea who this guy David is. His reputation has preceded him. And um, there's no way that David is going to be safe in Gath. So he has to head out and go to another location. The next stop of the journey is a cave in, a, in an area known as Adullam. And it's here that David establishes or that David experiences a following. His brothers come and join him there. Partly because they're his brothers and partly because I'm sure their lives are in jeopardy. I'm sure that Saul would love to take David's brothers out uh, if he can. But it's also here that about 400 men from, how do I want to say this kindly? Um, the ragged edge of society. How's that? Is that a nice way of putting it? Uh, 400 men from the ragged edge of society also gather with David and uh, fall in behind him as his people. But a cave and 400 men, even though they are scallywags, that would be another nice way of putting it, um, even though they are scallywags, are not enough to protect David from Saul, his network of spies, and the entire Israelite army. So he's got to keep moving. And his next stop brings him down here to Moab land of Moab. Now, that just makes sense for two reasons. Number one, David's great-grandmother is who? Ruth. She's originally from where? Got it. So she, he's just going to his home turf, all right? He's going to his great-grandma's home. Um, it also makes sense because, once again, it's a foreign country. Saul has no authority here. So the equivalent would be, you know, we tried to go to Canada, but we discovered we can't stay there. So we head to Mexico instead. You know, we just got to get out of the country because we're going to get caught if we stay in here. Right? By the way, this whole region is about the size of Rhode Island. Okay? Kind of small. You take Rhode Island and tip it on its side. It's about this area. All right? So kind of a small area. It looks like, at this point, David has found security. He's with family. He's in a foreign country where Saul has no authority. There's just one problem. For reasons that we do not have time for this morning to explain, Israelites are not allowed to be in friendly relations with Moabites. And so, even though the king of Moab has assured David, you're safe here, you can live here, in fact, your parents can come and live here with you in complete safety, even though all of that has happened, a prophet by the name of Gad comes to David and says, hey David, what are you doing? Don't you remember where God said, you're not allowed to have um, treaties with the Moabites? To which David said, oh yeah, I forgot about that. I don't know exactly what he said, but what I, I know what he did. He packed his group up, and he moves back over here into the region of Judah. Now, I want to pause there because I want to point something out to you. David is safe in these two foreign countries. But God says, huh, you're not hanging here. I'm going to bump you back into the fray. Get back in there. 
You're not about to find your safety and security from a foreign country. You're going to find your safety and your security from me. Remember, God says, I am sovereign. I, I've got you back. Meanwhile, Saul hears that um, the priests at Nob had helped David, and he flies into a rage. Uh, in fact, he accuses his son, Jonathan, of being the kingpin in a family conspiracy to overthrow Saul. And Saul becomes increasingly desperate. He's paranoid to the point that he now believes David is looking for any opportunity to kill him. How's that for irony? I mean, Saul's out trying to kill David with all his worth. David is just desperately trying to stay alive. And it's Saul's idea, well, David's trying to kill me. This shows you how far Saul has sunk since he's walked away from God. When he's informed that Ahimelech helped David, Saul decides that the entire priestly community of Nob is guilty. He sentences them to death. Both the priests and their families. And he orders his bodyguards to execute these people. Now, these bodyguards, just a couple of days ago, were under David's command. They know David is not trying to kill Saul. They know there is no conspiracy. And so for the second time in this story of 1 Samuel, we see Saul's men refusing to carry out a foolish royal order. But the spy who told Saul about all this is not an Israelite. He's an Edomite. And he has no problem killing priests or everything that looks like a priest. In fact, this spy kills every priest and their family and everybody else who lives in that town. Man, woman, child, and animal. Wipes them out. Now, do you remember what that type of warfare is called? Go ahead, use that sound. Remember? Harem, right? We've seen that many times, that God, in his, in his ultimate judgment over a town, is just in, in saying, hey, wipe it all out. And our warfare, once again, shows you how far away from God's plan Saul has fallen. He allows this type of warfare that is only sanctioned when God says so. He uses this type of warfare on God's very priests. Well, in contrast to Saul's atrocity, the next scene demonstrates David's faithfulness before God. He learns that the Philistines are looting a town, it's right up here, called Cali. He wants to go help. But first, he goes to God. And he says, hey, God, should I go help? God says, uh-huh. I mean, it's the really new Pastor Jim version. Okay? Well, 400 men against the Philistine army is not exactly fair odds. And these 400 men are saying, hey, David, are you nuts? We're not going to go fight the Philistines. You better go double check. So David does. He goes back to God. God, are you sure? God says, uh-huh. So off they go. And they go up to Caleb. And predictably, uh, David is victorious over the Philistines. He, uh, he saves the people of Caleb and... He gathers up all kinds of Philistine loot. Now, Saul finds out that David's in Cala. Cala is a walled city. And Saul is uh, Saul excited. He figures, I've got my man. All I have to do is march my troops down to Cala, lay siege on the city, and uh, I've got David, because the people of Caleb will give David up in order to save their own necks. And he's right. That's exactly what the people of Caleb would do. Except David, who had an intelligence network of his own, 
heard about Saul's plot. And he went to God and said, God, do I need to get out of Dodge? And God said, uh-huh. <laughs> so he does. And uh, David takes his forces, which, by the way, have now grown to 600. I'm not good with math, but I believe that's about a 50% increase, right? Pretty good increase. He takes his men, and they head for this uh, desert region of Ziph. where an incredible cat and mouse game ensues. As you read through the story, David's brilliance as a military commander comes shining through. His strategy includes moving frequently, um, staying in remote areas, and camping in easily defensible positions. But Saul has his own intelligence network. And he's figured out how to track David's movement. He's got some tribal people who are, who are willing to give David up at every turn. And they keep him informed, they keep Saul informed of where David moves and when he moves so that Saul is able to set up ambushes and, and launch pre-dawn raids. He also, the, the spy network also tells Saul who it is that's helping David so that Saul can cut off David's supply network. Back and forth they go. The story comes to a climax as Saul's men are closing in on David. The two forces are literally on opposite sides of the same hill. And David is running out of ground. There's nowhere else for David to run. There is nowhere for David to hide. And just when it looks like all hope is lost, a messenger arrives to tell Saul that the Philistines are attacking. Saul is left with no options. He's got to quit pursuing his personal agenda in order to protect the nation of Israel. So off Saul goes to fight the Philistines while David and his crew head over to En Gedi and find relief there. Now, we've covered a lot of ground this morning, literally. And as the story unfolds, Saul repeatedly looks worse and worse and worse. Meanwhile, David is looking better and better and better. But there's one sentence in, in, these, two, in these three chapters that I think better than any other verse in the passage describes and clarifies this season of David hiding from Saul. Here it is, 1 Samuel 23 Verse 14. It's actually just the second half of the verse. It says, day after day, Saul searched for him, that is David, but God did not give David into his hands. Day after day, Saul searched for David, but God <coughs> did not give David into his hands. You see, ultimately, this story is not about Saul's failures. Nor is it about David's victories. The story of David hiding from Saul is a story of God's sovereignty. Oh, make no mistake about it. The threats David faced were real. They were very real. They were intense. We've seen time and time again how Saul treats people who get in his way. But it isn't David's cunning. It isn't his brilliant strategy. It isn't even his faithfulness before God that keeps him from Saul's grasp. No, the fact of the matter is, God was not willing for David to be captured. Therefore, David was not captured. Period. End of story. God said, not yet. God was not willing to give David into Saul's hands. Therefore, David was not handed into Saul's hands. God saved David. Now, as I've been thinking about how this story from so many years ago connects with our own stories today, 
I'm reminded that regardless of how intense the dangers become, no matter how hopeless our situation may get, even, even when there's no way out, in Christ we are secure. Amen? Yeah. In Christ, we are secure. And I will admit that the dangers that we face in this world are very real. They are intense. I, I understand that the situation in Ukraine or in the Middle East could launch a global war at any time. I understand that. That's a very real problem that we face in this world. The reality is that the Ebola virus could break out in the United States and, and destroy just as many people as it has been raging in Sierra Leone. That absolutely could happen. It could be that students who are heading back to college end up being confronted by temptations or influences that threaten, maybe even wreck, their faith. That's a very real possibility. Any of us could be the next person to discover that a friend or a loved one has taken their lives. The challenges that we face in this world are very real. They are extreme. And, and I am in no way trying to minimize the problems that we face. But here's what I know. God is still sovereign. God is greater than the greatest threats we face. God is more powerful than the, the most desperate dangers that come our way. God is sovereign over everything. He's sovereign over everything that is visible and invisible. God is sovereign. And that is why we can be absolutely certain that in Christ we are secure. Amen? Yeah. You see, at just the right time, God stepped in for David, right? When it looked like there's no chance, there's no way David gets out of this one, at just the right moment, God stepped in for David. Brothers and sisters, at just the right moment, God stepped in for us. See, all of us were lost. All of us were going our own way. All of us deserve death as the just penalty for our sin. And yet, at just the right time, while we were all still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus' death on the cross paid the price for all of our sin. He substituted his life for ours, purchasing our salvation. His resurrection has defeated death forever. And his return to heaven guarantees us the hope of a glorious future. We know all of that. We've heard it countless times. But I want to point out one last part of this. Our present is just as secure as our future. Let me say that one again. Our present is just as secure as our future. 
in Christ, we are secure. Despite all of the problems that swirl around us, in Christ, we're secure. He promises to never leave us, to never forsake us. He promises to walk with us through every twist and turn of life. And And even if we were to find ourselves in the pit of despair, even should we find ourselves in a place that is so desperate and so dark that we have no hope, even there, God is present with us. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, God is present. And we are secure. Oh, brothers and sisters, in Christ, we're secure. In Christ, we have hope. We have everything. This is the good news that we celebrate as we come to the Lord's table this morning. We celebrate the fact that Christ has purchased our salvation. And because of what he has done for us, we are